Sneakers and Cleats, the podcast. Welcome back to the Sneakers and Glades podcast. It's Monday, March 18th. This is episode 85, and it is the best week of the year after Selection Sunday yesterday. We now have a bracket in our hands. Don Harris, Matt. Are you serious? It's tournament time, baby. Rock and roll time. I love the hands hands thing that Dick Vitale always does. It's always right here. Right here. (laughs) It's always like that. It's tournament time for everybody who uh, is questioning what day it is. We have brackets in our hands. We're going to talk all about it. Each We'll go through each region, maybe pick a Final Four team, who we think maybe is going to be the biggest upset in there. We also have a um, alien-like game from Victor Wembenyama last night against the Brooklyn Nets up in Austin. We'll get all of Don's takes from the I-35 series. But, as always, we start with the number game. And for me, there are only two for 85. Okay. Antonio Gates comes to mind in, immediately as a player. That's my era. Um, Anthony Totri, he was sitting in that chair. That's one of his favorite players of all time because he's a uh, Charger fan. But when I think 85, I think 85 Chicago Bears. That's the first thing that comes to mind, probably a top three team of all time sure. in the NFL. Uh, maybe the best defense of all time. That can be debated with the 2000 Ravens and 2013 Seattle Seahawks, 2015 Broncos, kind of, kind of some of those teams. But Broncos are on the fringe. Maybe the Ravens but, team, but I think the 85 Bears are number one. Yeah, I think one of uh, – uh, Mike Greenberg always says that that team could have punted on first down and probably still went 8-8. Eight and eight. Like, that team was that good. They were that good. It, no question about it's, it. It's That's the team I – that's the number, that's the player. that Those are the players that I think of when I think of 85. I think Chicago Bears. I think the 85 Bears, I think your, your list is good here with the Jack Youngblood and Ocho Cinco. I mean – yeah. How can you not think Ocho Cinco? It's his name. It really bothers me that his name is Ocho Cinco and not Och- Ochenta y Cinco. Oh. Like, it, that's not actually 85. It's 8-5. Right, right. <laughs> like, but, you know, David Robinson was 5-0, not 50. Yeah, but that, you know, he didn't say it in Spanish, did sure. he? No. no. <laughs> like, he's just it's a admiral. unique thing for sure. Um, Bob, who am I missing? You reminded Dave me. Dave Logan. Uh, Dave Logan. Dave Logan one of, uh, from Brian Sipes. One the of big redhead. Uh, and David Njoku. Uh, and Njoku, yeah. I mean, not really on the same level as Antonio Gates and uh, the 85 Bears. but I'll Dave take Logan it. was a good football player. I had no speed. Very little talent. Brian Sipe. <laughs> Brian Sipe, yes. Was his quarterback. Cardiac kids. There was two other players that I wanted to put on here. Um, I forgot who they are because they wore stupid numbers and were defensive players. So I didn't want to. They wore like in, they were eighty five, but they were DNs and linebackers, just like Jack Youngblood. And I was like, you know, that really bothers me. So I'm not going to put him on this list. Um, Jack Youngblood put his whole name on his back of his jersey. Jack Youngblood. It said Jack in small letters right above Youngblood in regular letters. Was there two Youngbloods? There was. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, I have a trivia question for you. Uh-huh. Who is the only NBA player to ever wear the number 85? I don't know. It's a horrible number. It's recent. Recent within the last 12 years. Uh, I'll say uh, uh, Meta World Peace. No, close though. Uh, Baron Davis. Really? Baron Davis wore 85. Why? I, I don't know. <laughs> Let's call, call him up. Somebody call Baron. <laughs> Was he 13 before and didn't have 13 or... I don't know. It was with his second. It was when he went to the uh, Mavs and when his second stint with the Warriors. Not in that eighty-five. Yeah, it's a stupid number for a for an NBA player. Okay, but, incredibly athletic for as stocky as he was. He was a good player. I mean, he was part of that team that beat the uh, beat the Mavs as an eight seed, and they were a one seed. That that was like the first time in NBA history, I believe, that happened. He was a very good player. But wasn't that the team that had like? Uh, who else was on? I, I'm going to go off on a tangent. Steven Jackson was on that team. The I'm pretty sure too. Oh, the the, the, Warriors. the Warriors team. Yeah. Um, also in '85, the Niners beat the Dolphins. The because the Bears actually won the '86 Super Bowl. That's so this right. this is in the year '85. So this is technically the year before the '85 Bears. The Niners beat the Dolphins in Super Bowl thirty-eight. Uh, excuse me, in, in the Super Bowl thirty-eight to sixteen. Super Bowl MVP was Joe Montana. The regular season MVP was Dan Marino that year. NCAA tournament in 1985. Oh. Villanova beat Georgetown 66 to 64. What a f- greatest, <laughs> one of the great moments in college basketball history. Such a good game. One of the biggest, this is the third time they played. They were both from the Big East. Georgetown dominated everybody that year. They were more dominant than Houston is this year. 
as a runaway number one. I don't know what Vegas line was in that game. It should have been 15. I can look real But quick. they went something ridiculous, something like 22 for 24 from the field. They didn't miss. See if I can name the starting five from that Villanova team. Wasn't that the Patrick giving Georgetown team? Yes, one of. Patrick played in three Final Fours. That was Dwayne McLean. And the other McLean and Ed Pinckney. Um, Harold Jensen had a great game. I think he was like 11 for 11 or something. I Huge upset. I'm not going to be able to find that in the next two seconds. But. Raleigh Massimino. And then uh, Patrick Ewing then got drafted number one overall by the Knicks in that following NBA draft. So he went out, out of Georgetown a loser. Win the envelope in the old tumbler for the lottery, right? That was the first year of the NBA lottery. And the big conspiracy theory was David Stern had to deliver a star to New York, the biggest market in the league. And in those days, they put the eight, nine teams that were in the lottery on these giant envelopes. And they put the envelopes in a big game show type tumbler that was clear plastic. Stern cranked it, opened the door, reached in and picked out the first envelope, not the eighth. The first went to number one. And then they did it. The second one was eight, seven, six, five, four. So that was weird. Why? I don't know. Why would you do it that way? Well, the theory was that he cranked the tumbler, reached in, and picked the frozen envelope. All right, that's the frozen envelope. Cold, and it made it made Patrick Ewing go to the Knicks. Now they do it uh, much more secretively and uh, much, much more scientific. Much more scientifically. Um, also, in '85, the Lakers beat the Celtics four games to two. The Royals beat the Cardinals four games to three. They became the first World Series champion to win a World Series after losing the first two games at home. I was their last World Series as well until 2015. It was the George Brett team. Was that the Don Denkinger game? First base umpire that missed the crucial call at first by like two feet? That I don't know. John, you know who would know that? Chuck Migatinic. Yeah. Chuck, we need, where is he? Laker, call him up. The Lakers over the Celtics was uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, MVP of the finals at age 40. Or 38 or something. It was ridiculous. Maybe, maybe uh, LeBron will do that next year. Uh, and then the Valero Texas Open, John Mahaffey. John Mahaffey. Mahaffey. One in a playoff that year at the Valero Texas Open. So let's get to the bracket. We have our sheets of integrity right here. So there's a lot of things that are interesting about this bracket. There's a lot of things about the uh, bracket that are interesting every year. But this one, I think, has a little bit more intrigue, especially to us here in Texas. There's a lot of Texas teams. Um, not a lot of them have easy paths, though. Um, looking at the bracket holistically at first, excuse me, UConn, Purdue, Houston. North Carolina, they are the one seeds. Uh, general impl- impressions of the entire field as we look at it, I'm really surprised that more Big East teams didn't get in. I think the Big East got pretty shafted. Um, Providence, I think, was good enough to make it. St. John's, I think, was good enough to make it. They were had a bad quad one or uh, quad one record, but I think that they they showed enough down the stretch after Petrino ki- killed his team. Like, absolutely just murdered them in the media. Um, Rick Pitino? Yes. Yeah, excuse me. Um, Rick Pitino did, like, what coaches are not supposed to do and said, like, it's just my team. Like, I can't coach any better than this. They're just not playing well. He doesn't have lateral quickness. He doesn't have this. He doesn't have that. And then after he said that, they went on a tear. Um, I thought they were good enough to get in. I thought OU was good enough to get in as well. Oh, yeah. The two that stood out for me are OU and South Florida. Yeah, I don't know – you can you can have a couple of minutes on South Florida because I think that's an absolute travesty that they didn't make the tournament. Yeah, they. I mean, you know, FAU went to the Final Four last year. They were supposed to run away with the the conference, and South Florida beat them and won the conference regular season. Got ousted in the semis of the conference tournament, and FAU's going along with uh, whoever won the tournament. UAB. Uh, you're correct. They beat so Temple. so. They keep South Florida out now. I get it. UAB beat you know Iowa State and some other really good teams on their strength of schedule and the whatever they look at the bracketologists look at all right. the the RPI and all of that. But South Florida, uh, Abdul Rahim has done a great job there. First year there came from Kennesaw State where he took them to the tournament last year. They almost 
uh, pulled a 15-2 upset last year. He gets the South Florida job. I think they were 24 and seven or something like that. They were outrageously good. They were five, I think they were 500 to one to win that uh, conference in the regular season and they yeah. won it yeah. outright. Yeah. Like he did a fantastic job. And the fact that they didn't win their conference tournament as well and they didn't get in is an absolute travesty. Shout out Griff Mahone, uh, McHone, uh, assistant coach from Bernie High School. Meanwhile, you still have um, FAU who didn't just get in, they got an eight seed. Yeah. Like they are highly seeded for a team that completely underperformed this year. They're pretty good though. They, they, they could be a spoiler good. in this They're tournament. good, but and they made a run last year to the final four. But it's like if it almost feels like they're they're rating them in this tournament for what for like, happened last year. Yeah, I agree. So it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Meanwhile, the SEC and Big Twelve, they both got eight teams in. Pretty deserving there. I don't know how you don't put eight Big Twelve teams in. Maybe TCU got maybe a little highly rated. Yeah, um, the, didn't they didn't they win a first round game in the tournament? Yeah, I mean TCU's gonna get ousted, I think, pretty quick. Um there's a couple of those teams I think they are gonna be Houston. ousted pretty quick. Yeah, but Houston also got destroyed by Iowa State and is still a number one seed. So we'll see, we'll see about that as well. Uh let's get to we're gonna go through each region here. So um and I when I'm editing this, we'll put the region on the screen so you can see what we're talking about. Um, we'll go to the East first in the East. Yukon is the one seed. I think the East is a complete beast. The East it, is so good. The Eastern uh, region. I think it plays out true to form and it's Yukon over Iowa state in the regional final. I don't think so. Um, we saw San Diego state make a run to the final four last year and make a run to the finals actually. So we could have in the, what is that? The sweet 16 have a San Diego state versus Yukon matchup. I don't know. From last I got year. Auburn over San Diego state. I think Auburn, Auburn can win the whole thing. I think Auburn could win the whole thing. Bruce Pearl's Auburn uh, team is so they're good. good. They are phenomenal. And they're not just winning right now. They are smashing. They're people. really good. That's if you, if you're filling out your bracket and you want a, a pick to go to the elite eight, go with Auburn. I am. Uh, I have, you can't have Auburn going to the elite eight. Because well, that would mean they beat they, UConn. Well, they lose to UConn. What does that mean? They go to the Sweet 16. Sweet 16. Okay. Yeah. So I think Auburn beats UConn. I might pick that too. I think Auburn. So in the in this bracket, in the East, you have, and I'll put it up like right here. <laughs> um, you have UConn. You have Florida Atlantic versus Northwestern. UConn's going to beat Stetson. You have San Diego State versus UAB. You have Auburn and Yale. BYU, Duquesne, or Duquesne, if you want to be like Chuck McAtinney. Um <laughs> Illinois, Moorhead State. Uh, Duquesne, Washington. first time in the tournament in 47 years. Yeah, nine, uh, 1977. 1977. Right? You know who their star player was in 1977? Nope, the sure only player me. in NBA history that – and I know where everybody went to college. You do. You are really good at that. The only player in NBA history that went to Duquesne won championships. Oh, hey, Bob popped up, popped up the graphic. Hey, thanks, Bob. Appreciate you. I'm here for you. Um, Norm Nixon. The Lakers point guard. They play with magic. No one knows that except for you. Duquesne. <laughs> and then Iowa State at the bottom against uh, They're South really Dakota good. State. They're playing good. I think that this plays out like this. I think the biggest upset in this region might be more head state over Illinois. I could see Illinois coming out and laying an egg and being down maybe 15 in the first half uh, and then trying to storm back and just not having enough juice at the end. Terrence okay. Shannon has held that team together with – with they just won the Big Ten tournament, they're really good. I'm not saying that Illinois is not really good. Illinois definitely has the potential to be a Final Four team, let alone an Elite I'm not A-team. picking any 14s this year. I think that Moorhead State has a really good chance to beat Illinois. I think Duquesne has a really good chance to beat BYU, and I think UAB has a really good chance to beat. And San Kentucky's Diego State. struggling; they could lose to Oakland. We're not even there yet. But I know. So but your we're final four. Slow. So your final four pick is going to be UConn. I don't know yet. Might be Auburn. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. I, I don't turn my bracket in until Wednesday night late. Thursday yeah, we got morning. three. We got three more days. But hey, I'm trying to fill up my bracket based on your picks. So <laughs> if you if you're filling out your brackets based on our picks, good luck to you. <laughs> I haven't won it in three years. I haven't. Last year, our news director was second place after the first weekend, and she doesn't even. This is no slight to her. She's just not a sports person. Tangie Patton won the whole thing when you're picking mascots. Yeah, my my wife just picked her bracket based on the color of their jerseys. Very good. She picked North Carolina to win because she likes the powder blues. Yeah. <laughs> I picked the team farthest north one year, and it didn't work out very well. Yeah. 
yeah, just stick away, stay away from any Ohio team. You'll probably be fine. All right, let's move uh, on. I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go Auburn as my Final Four team. Okay. Um, that let's go to the West. To the North, West. To the West is where we find North Carolina. Uh, they're the number one seed. Other teams in this district or in this region district. I'm getting still on high school right now. Um, Alabama is the four seed there. Baylor the three seed. Uh, Arizona is the two seed. I think there's a real chance Arizona gets upset either in the first or second round. Agreed. I think that Arizona is a paper tiger. This is not just because I'm a Sun Devil and I hate the Wildcats. They are a paper tiger. This is the worst team that they've had over the last few years, and they still haven't won. Something special is happening with Long Beach State too. I th- I love their team. I'm going to pick that game. I think Long Beach State is the is the 15 to upset the two this they year. They fired their coach two weeks ago and let him coach the tournament. And they end up. Winning the whole thing and yeah, getting in. Exactly. And now he's going to coach the tournament. That's it's, awesome. It's so good. Good for him. And also, uh, something to keep in mind, every year, the last three years, a 15 has beaten a two. So yeah. you have to pick I'm one picking of them. that Long Beach over Arizona. Don, I don't agree. you have an affinity then, for Grand Canyon? One more time. Don, don't you have an affinity for Grand Canyon? I do Canyon? have an affinity for Grand Canyon. So My son went there. So you're going to be picking Grand Canyon over St. Mary's? I was going to pick Grand Canyon as a 12 over a 5 when they had BYU on the bracketology. I'm not a fan of BYU, I think they're vulnerable. In fact, I would pick BYU to lose to, to Duquesne. Duquesne. But uh, but St. Mary's is too good. St. Mary's is too good. Yeah, uh, I think in this one, this one goes pretty chalky to me. You know who the coach at Grand Canyon is? Who? Bryce Drew, Scott Drew's brother. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Nice. Um, I think Baylor loses to – I think New Mexico's live. I think New Mexico will get to the uh, Sweet 16. They are a really, really good team. JT Toppin – uh, Obi Toppin's brother is really, really good. They have another guy named Dent, who their point guard, who just distributes all distributes it all over the floor. They're a really, really solid team. I think that they could upset Baylor in the next round. You think they beat they get by Clemson? I think they get by Clemson easily. I think they struggle against Baylor, but I think they could beat Baylor. Is that Steve Alford's team? Uh, no, Steve Alford's the Oregon. Who's at New Mexico now? I don't know. I got Baylor and North Carolina in the final. So you got. Baylor, North Carolina, and the Elite Eight with who in the come, regional final with who coming out? Carolina. There, R.J. Davis. I'm all in on air. R.J. Davis. I just don't believe in Armando Baycott and Hubert Davis. I or uh, I just I just really don't. North Carolina is really good. They're really good. I'm not saying they're not, but I and I think they'll get to the Elite Eight just because I think the rest of that bracket's really kind yeah. of kind of weak. Uh, that top half of that bracket. I think Alabama's going to lose within the first two games, two, maybe three games. They I might... think Baylor can come out of the region. I think Carolina can, but I'm going to go with Carolina. Yeah, I think the uh, final is going to, or the uh, Elite Eight is going to be North Carolina and New Mexico. Okay. And I think it'll be probably be North Carolina getting to the That's final four. 11 seed, man. Wow. To the Elite Eight, not Gutsy. to the final four. Gutsy. I really, I really like Baylor, especially if uh, Long Beach, or excuse me, I really like New Mexico, especially if Long Beach State beats Arizona. Who else is going to beat them? Nevada's okay. Baylor. I don't think they lose to Baylor. All right. All right. So right now, let's get to the South region. South is where we find the Houston Cougars, who just got beat like a drum against Iowa State. Nothing and to worry about. I don't know. I'd be worried about it. <laughs> that was bad. That was ugly. They got. They were getting doubled up, sixty-four to thirty-two at one point. It was horrible. It was just one of those days. It was the worst game I've seen them play in years. Um. But anyway, so Houston is the one seed, Longwood 16. Then you find Nebraska and Texas A&M, which I think will be a really interesting first-round game. Nebraska is favored by three. That's um, uh, Hoiberg's team, isn't it? Um, They have this guy on their team that reminds me of Jeremy Lin. Their point guard is is like Lin Sanity 2.0. It's this little Asian point guard who just makes it from anywhere, doesn't have any care in the world, just goes bad out of hell. It's so fun to watch. Um, I don't know who wins that game, Nebraska or Texas A&M, but it really doesn't matter because they're both going to lose to Houston anyway. That's correct. So uh, Wisconsin plays James Madison. James Madison. I think that could be the upset of this region, James Madison over Wisconsin. Only lost three games. I haven't looked at their schedule, but I will. James Madison is a, I believe it's a five-point dog to Wisconsin. Wisconsin played really well. They were like 14-1 and one at the beginning of the season, ended up uh, faltering down the stretch. They were like 3-8 and eight and then performed really well in the conference tournament. Gave Beat Illinois. Purdue. Gave Excuse me, gave Illinois all they could handle. Beat Purdue. And beat Purdue. Purdue was so, going to be I the mean, number one overall Wisconsin's seed. a really good team. However, I think they lose to James Madison. I really do. Um, Duke and Vermont. Uh, Duke is going to do what Duke does and lose in like the third round this year. Because it's either they win the 
whole thing or they lose in the third round or the second round. So I don't I'm not really worried about Duke. I could see Duke losing to Wisconsin in the second round. I could see Duke losing to James Madison in the second round. You're right. <laughs> um Texas Tech against NC State. I don't really think it matters who wins that game because Kentucky is going to beat both of them. Kentucky's the yeah. run and gun team. People keep picking Kentucky to make it to the final four, and I don't see it. Like Kentucky is so bad defensively. They can everyone's like they can play defense when they want to play defense. And it's like, okay, well, why don't they ever want to play defense? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, Kentucky's on my possible list of a 14 knocking off a three. Yeah, I, I don't have any faith in Kentucky. I could see them losing the first two rounds. And then uh, Florida just lost one of their best players to a, a compound fracture. Oh fracture. Don't watch that video. Oh, that was bad. It's like it's like when Paul George broke his his uh, tibia fibula when he landed on the stanchion. Let's it, put it this way. It reminds me of that. Let's put it this way. It was a broken leg and there was blood. Yeah. So it broke through the skin. Yeah, you don't need to see it. Um, so I don't have any faith in Florida. I think they, they could be upset by either Colorado or uh, Boise State. I like Colorado a lot. I think Colorado could make it to uh, the Sweet 16, maybe even the Elite Eight. Great great players. Yeah. Not and a then, great team, but they got NBA talent on that team. And then Marquette. There's so many question marks with Marquette because of Shaka Smart and, the, and uh, Tyler Kolick, who's been injured for the last couple of weeks because of an oblique strain. If you remember last year, Marquette was a really high seed. They were coming in without Tyler Kolick, who got injured in one of their early games, and then they ended up losing pretty early on in the tournament. He's the, he's the straw that stirs the drink for them. So if he's not healthy, they're not going anywhere. So I could see Colorado making a run. Uh, Final four? Western Kentucky, by the way. Shout out Steve Lutz, East Central High School uh, coach. is the coach of uh, Western Kentucky. And Sharon uh, uh, Jackson from Wagner High School is playing for him. So shout out uh, Western Kentucky. We're local kids, uh, but I have I got Houston coming out of there. Yeah, Houston coming out of there. I probably have. I haven't made my decision on this yet, but for the sake of time, I'll take Houston as well. Uh, I'll have my final pick on Thursday when we do this. Um, and the Midwest region, Purdue is the one seed there. That's where you find Utah State, TCU, Gonzaga, Kansas, uh, South Carolina, Oregon, Creighton, Akron, Texas, and Tennessee. Um, to me, if Kansas is healthy, which is a huge question mark, they can make it to a Final Four. But if if uh, Kevin McCullers and um, – McCuller. Sorry. Yeah, Kevin. I keep getting him and Lance McCullers, those two names mixed up. If Kevin McCuller Jr. Shout out Wagner High School. Yeah, Wag, from Wagner High School, one of the best two-way players in the entire country. Went to Texas Tech and then transferred to Kansas. Um, if Kevin McCuller and Hunter Dickinson don't play, they're screwed. They might Tennessee comes out of that bracket for me no matter what. No matter what. I love Tennessee. Really? Yeah. They performed like dog crap against Mississippi State. I I think the Connect kid is really, really good, and Rick Barnes has done a great job with that team. I mean, they're playing in a really hard league, and you know, I don't put a lot of co- – um, I don't put a lot of stock in conference tournaments because um, you see teams lose in the semis or the final of the conference tournament and go on to win the championship. It's almost like a tune-up, you know, and – like Houston, that was a complete anomaly. Houston's going to come out and destroy. Let me ask you this. Purdue it was the team that lost as a 16 versus 1 last year. They lost in the first round of the tournament uh, to, I forgot what the team was, Fairleigh Dickinson or, or Farley Dickinson. Yeah. Um, the last time that happened was Virginia in 2018, and then in 2019, Virginia came back and won the whole thing. Do you see Purdue making a run here after they're good getting destroyed last year. They're good, but I think there's something to be said for your, your clutch gene when something like that happens. That's why I don't believe in them. I mean, I don't know if Utah state or TCU are good enough to beat them, but I think Kansas is. So I don't, I don't see, think they get out of that side. I don't think they make it past the second round. I'll just say it. Yeah. I, I don't think they can be, I think they can be Utah state or TCU. Uh, TCU is a worse matchup for them because they press more. But I think that Utah State's going to roll through both of those teams, and I think Utah State is going to make the Sweet 16. Really? Yes. Uh, if I'm going to pick a team out of that uh, area, though, I if Kansas is healthy, I'm taking Kansas. If uh, Kansas is not healthy, then I'm probably going to end up taking Tennessee as well. Yeah. Uh, so overall, overall impressions, do you think this is a better, worse, good, bad I love tournament. it. I, I think it's a great tournament because I think there's so many upsets and there's so like like anybody can make the final four. Like almost, you know, all the way through like 
like six and seven seeds can make the final four. I like this. I mean, Texas Tech could make a final four. Um, I, I really believe that after seeing how they played in the Big 12 this year. So I think it's wide open. Nothing will surprise me. But I do think after knocking on the door all these years, Kelvin Sampson and his guys, because of their veteran guards and length and size defense. Uh, and defense, and they just play so hard, I think Houston wins it. Yeah, I mean, two Sweet 16s and Elite Eight and a Final Four in the last four years. You can't yeah. get much better than Kelvin Sampson has been yeah. over there. So and, and, and look, I've always picked my brackets – with senior guards, you can have, you know, the the one and duns that are going to go play in the NBA, and they they can be great players. But when it gets to tournament time, like San Diego State last year, San Diego State last year, those guys were twenty five years old, man. Yeah, I know, and they're playing against eighteen year olds. Yeah, I I tend to agree with you. I usually choose the veteran teams, the veteran guards, the veteran big men, like anybody who has older players because they've been there before. And they're bigger and they're stronger and they're tougher and they're more mature. That's why I see Kentucky going out early, just because they're a young team. Always. So uh, this is the best event that we have all year. I'm sorry to every employer across the country who is going to be, get a lack of production this week because of men and women who are who are, have like three phones up at their computers and have a, a little screen on their <laughs> on their checking desktop, their scores. checking scores, checking brackets. Like, I'm sorry. This is the most unproduct- unproductive week of the year. This is also, I think Thursday is the day that, or no, excuse me, Wednesday is the day that the most vasectomies are scheduled in uh, the country every year because men sit, sit at home the next day and just watch the tournament. Are you serious? I swear to God, that's actually a fact. That the most vasectomies in the country are scheduled on Wednesdays, on the Wednesday before the tournament. So you want me to tell you my vasectomy story? Not even a little. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. I mean, we're already, we might not even get to the Spurs. Let's hear the vasectomy story. <laughs> so I uh, I go to the doctor for the consult and I said, okay, so how does this work? And he goes, well, we give you a topical and then we do the thing. And I said, a topical. So you like, there's like a cream or something to deaden the thing. And he goes, no, it's a shot. And I go, okay, so you give me a shot where? Like in the groin, like in the leg. And he goes, no, it's in the, huh? And I go, <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I will not be having this done. <laughs> so I left. And then Julie said. And then like three <laughs> weeks later, I get a hernia. And I had to go under the knife completely, you know, under and all that stuff. So I'm on the consult for that. And I said, hey, by the way, while I'm under, <laughs> you mind if I call the my urologist guy and get the vasectomy done at the same time? No problem. So I'm out. I get both done. The hernia was so painful in recovery, I never felt the vasectomy. And it would have been better if you got both of those done the Wednesday before the tournament. Probably. Think of how great those two days of recovery would have been. That was such a painful recovery. With your peas and whatnot on icing it down. Anyway, um, I don't even want to think about that. Yeah. Let's go. (laughs) Sorry, Bob, you have one? No. We're really talking about vasectomies right now, guys. I'm sorry I brought no. this up. You're the only one here. I, I, hats off to the guys that can take the shot. <laughs> I don't even like getting people or seeing people get like kicked in the groin. It just gives me that. I got a buddy of mine who's got an eye issue, an eye problem, and and he has to get injections with a big nope. needle in the eyeball. Nope, take my eye out. I don't care. I'm not getting. That's I'm not getting injections. Th- I think that alone would make me infertile. Yeah, that <laughs> alone. <laughs> <laughs> nope, I'm That's good. That's a great. Line. All right, so. <laughs> <laughs> Wemby uh, goes beast mode in Austin. Let's talk about that before everybody tunes out because of our vasectomy stories here. Um, the I-35 series came to an end. Yeah. Spurs lost on Friday to the Nuggets. That's to be expected. They'll lose anywhere to the Nuggets. I mean, a lot of people lose to the Nuggets. That's not abnormal. But then they beat the Nets on Sunday, and Wemby went completely bonkers. 33-15, excuse me, 33-15, 7 and 7. Uh, the second seven being blocks. So one of them only been done three times before, twice by Kareem, once by Joel Embiid. And the last one basically sealed the game for him. Um, game blocked, saving block at the top of the square. Yeah, blocked Schroeder uh, as he was going in to make that layup as well. That was called the goaltending. Ended up not being a goaltending. He was just absolutely breathtaking. Like he, he, I think sometimes I think we're already starting to take for granted how good and how how much of an alien. I'm not he taking, is. I don't think so. Here's what I think is happening in San Antonio. People aren't paying attention because of the record. 
Yeah. There's what? been a lot of Spurs fans just tune out and ah, they're not any good. They don't watch. If you're not watching, you're missing NBA history in the making. He he's the only person in NBA history, period, with 200 blocks, 100 threes, and 75 steal in a season. No one else has ever done it, and he's got 15 games to go. He has more block shots in his rookie year right now than 81% of active NBA players have in their careers. Think seems, about that. Seems good. <laughs> it's just it, the number, like, like he's going to be on a 15-win team, and he should be first team all NBA, I mean, all defense. He should be defensive player of the year. He won't get it. And I think he can make a case that he's makes an, an all NBA team. I think he should be an all NBA player. I don't know. You got Jokic, you got Sabonis ahead of well, him. Depends. For sure. so, well, the problem with the all NBA teams, and this is a completely aside, the problem with all NBA teams, you have to do it by position. And you have to play 65 and games. And so I don't really understand where you would put him in position. Like maybe center. Do you put him at center? Do you put him I, at power I, I, forward? I don't, I don't think you have to be a center. I think there's three three you could put him at forward or center. Yeah. You, you can't put him at guard. Three, yeah. Yeah. Three, that's the problem uh, with all three NBA front teams. court players. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's the problem with the all NBA teams is you no, know, you actually have to pick centers. Well, he'll be a center then. And, and Jokic is first team. And I think Sabonis has to be second team. I don't think, does he play? He's more of a forward, though. I don't know. But um, either way, the things that Wemby is doing are Embiid would be, but he didn't play enough games. Right. The thing that Wemby, I mean, Rudy Gobert might make one just because uh, Wemby's better than Gobert. Cat. Yeah, they they've had a great year, but I mean, he might not make the threshold now anyway. But the things that Wemby is doing are considerably being discounted because of the team he's on. I think by True. by many of the Spurs uh, faithfuls around San Antonio. True. What he's doing is historic. What he's doing is making people tune in. And if you aren't paying attention, it is a travesty. You're missing it. You're you're missing history. Did you uh, see his it, dad? It, his dad shot last yeah, night. Yeah. Literally, if you go back to like right at it's right at the end of the game. It's pretty close to the end of the game, the end of the regulation, right? When he has the dad shot like yeah, a nerf yeah. it's like if you were playing basketball in the driveway with your kid and On your kid and your kid's a foot and a half shorter than you are that's what it looked like he just, just hold it up and he just he just <laughs> just like his dad blocks this year it's, it's ridiculous. yeah it's ridiculous but what i wanted to ask you about before we get out of here is it seems like every time i watch a game uh in the newsroom with you you're yelling about some stupidity that happened <sighs> on the court don't i don't want to start a fight i'm not trying to start a fight I'm just asking you, what do you yeah. think? What do you think that some of these players know how to play basketball? <laughs> Let's. I'll say this. I'll say this. I think Devin Vassell has greatly improved over the course of the season in his court awareness and his ability to find Wimby, and it's he's taken a huge step forward in playing the way that they're going to have to play with a player of Wimby's caliber. And I think he's learning that, and I think he's doing a really good job. I think there's a couple of other guys who do not. <laughs> hey, do you see how comfortable Wimby was playing in Austin? It's like he really likes playing in Austin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Don, give me your thoughts on the I-35 series as a whole this year, and then we'll get out of here. This thing is great. I think we found a lot of Spurs fans who go up there, a lot of Austin fans who love having the Spurs up there. I think they're doing just like the Celtics did in the 70s and 80s when they played five games a year in Hartford. They're just growing their fan base. And I think that the ridiculous talk of politicians like Tommy Calvert and Tony Gonzalez over the last few years about oh, the Spurs might move to Austin have been squashed with the fact that there's going to be a brand new downtown arena right where the Institute of Texan Culture sits. And I think you didn't hear that this year because of that. Wemby is the new Institute of Texan culture. He, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Let's put an Institute of France culture or French culture right there. And now, and now fear mongering politicians who try to get votes because of it or pass a bill called the SPUR resolution for local teams not losing. Come on, man. They were never going to Austin. Wemby likes playing there. But $500 million practice facility up at, up at the rock will do that for you too. Of course. So, They're never going anywhere Spurs. except to downtown. Hope, and hopefully to an NBA Finals at some point. Um, That's going to happen. 
God, I hope so. I, I don't really don't want to do this again for another five, 15 and 53 team. I hope they're not that bad. Next they're not going to be that bad, but they're not going to be great. They're not going to be great. This is going to take some time. Can they can they surpass 30 wins? <laughs> I don't know. It depends on who they get. But I can tell you this. This kid's 20 years old. The goal is from the time he turns 23 to the time he's 33, that 10 years, you want to win them all. But I don't know that they can get there at age 21. Well, that's all we got for you today on the Sneakers and Cleats podcast. Remember to download, rate, review, subscribe, give us a five-star rating, tell a friend, tell an enemy. On the way out, uh, Bob, any comments, remarks that you want to add in here from Bob's are trying viewers to stir or the anybody, pot. anybody else? Viewers no, or anybody uh, else? Our, our friend Tom Gr- uh, Guerrero. What's up, Tom? He says that uh, <laughs> he says Wemby needs a bright orange vest in order to be seen on the court. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it seems like see? sometimes. See, he's with me. Some of these guys aren't looking for him. <laughs> I mean, but they, Devin's they, gotten better. Devin has gotten better. Great insight from the business office. <laughs> Thanks for watching, Tom. Anybody else? All good? Bob, you don't have to worry about good. Tom and his brackets being unproductive. He's being unproductive right now watching this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we appreciate it, Tom. I can't. I'm kidding, Tom. <laughs> Go back to work, Tom. All right, that's all we got for you. We'll see you right back here on Thursday. Um, probably going to be listening to this on Thursday uh, instead of watching it because we got plenty of NCAA basketball to watch on Thursday. So we'll We're see not you. doing it on Thursday. Yeah, honestly, we should take that day off. Is anyone having, yeah. a, having a vasectomy on Wednesday? Uh, we'll see you right back here on Thursday. Have a good week.